Wendell, you investigated the Bill Meyer case um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. What was the result of your investigation? Well, first of all, we focused our investigation on scientific material that could be tested one way or another. And so we were looking for photographs, metal samples, plastic, buttons, anything that we could get, sounds, all of those were, were important to us. And especially the photographs because there was a large number of them. Uh, at that time, we were not investigating the subjective part of the case, the, the philosophy, the teaching, and that sort of thing. So we were, we were there collecting as much physical evidence as we could at the time, and we discovered a very important thing. We found that the Swiss themselves, the people in the group, had taken their evidence to Swiss scientists. We weren't the first scientists to look at it. We took them to the Swiss science. They had already tested the metal. We had, they had a report from a metallurgical agency in Zurich that we began our research with. So we were concentrating on the physical matter in the case that could be tested. Okay, that seems to frame. How did you learn about the Meyer case the very first time? I first heard about it from Lou Zinstag, a, uh, one of the earliest researchers in Europe. Let's wait a second. Okay. If it is behind the building, it is yeah. better. I'll, I'll make it a whole sentence. Right. Okay, Wendell, how did you learn about the Billy Meyer case the very first time? I first heard about the Meyer case from Lou Zinstag, who it's in her area, it was her, in her part of Europe, and she was then the leading UFO researcher in Europe. At the time, she published the first journal on UFOs in the German language in Basel. She, uh, this was happening in her backyard, so to speak, and uh, she, when she heard about it, she went to the household, to the area, looked up Mr. Meyer, and met him for the first time, viewed the pictures. She was collecting photographs also. And she called me after that meeting and told me that I must see what's happening in her country. She said, I've seen the most remarkable photographs ever. She said, I'm coming, coming to the United States next month with Timothy Good to look up some information on George Adamski, who, by the way, she was his translator in Europe. And I will bring them by your house if you're going to be home and I will call you from a local bus station when we go through from New York on our way to Los Angeles. I said, fine, I'd love to see them and I'll have some photographs to exchange with you. And we hung up and she, uh, months later, she came in with Timothy, Timothy Good. They came together. They called from the bus, the Greyhound station in downtown Tucson. I went down and picked them up. It just happened that Lee and Britt Elders were visiting me at the time. And when I brought them home, Lee and Britt were waiting for us and she sat down, set her purse down, took her coat off and opened her purse and spread 12 photographs out on the table. And they were in fact the most remarkable pictures I had ever seen anywhere. I said, those look too good to be true. And she said, I think they may be real. She said, I've been to the house, I've talked to people, the man is a very sincere man. I believe that he's telling the truth. He looks you square in the eye when he responds, but she says, I don't like the case. I said, what do you mean? Why don't you like the case? She said, well, they don't have a Jesus Christ. And I understood that mean, to mean that if they didn't have a Jesus Christ, they are from the opposite forces. And she was disenchanted over the lack of Christian religion involved. She was a born again Christian. And so I respected her decision, but I had to go look him in the eye myself after that. I had to go see for myself because it didn't necessarily have to have a Jesus Christ involved to be real for me. Absolutely. Woman, that seems to frame. Shelly. Before I come to the next question. <laughs> when you went to Maya the first time, what was your first impression of the case? Well, I'd been interviewing a lot of people for some 20 or 30 years, and I, you usually find that people that are not telling the truth are evasive. They look away to get their answers and things like that. Mr. Meyer looked me square in the eye and answered every question, it looked right into my soul when he answered the question. He gave me simple answers and very direct answers. He gave them to me in English, and I was convinced that he was telling me what he believed to be the truth. 
what convinced you most in the course of your investigation that indeed he is telling the truth? Well, I became <coughs> more convinced that the photographs were real when he took me over all of the photographic sites and I could see that there's no place to suspend lines into the scene. The hill dropped away at a steep ankle. There were no anchor points. There was no way that he could have thrown it into the scene because I saw scenery on the side of each image area that was greater than you could throw up a, a small model into. Also, it wasn't pushed up from the bottom, and I became convinced that there was no way I could figure out that anybody could get models into the scene. And if, they, if it was a model, it would have to be a very large one on the order of 20 feet in diameter, and that makes there are some problems in lifting those, too. So Lee and, and Tom were in London sweeping, uh, doing a, 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 a communication sweep in a bank, and I called them and said, you've got to come over here and see what I'm seeing. Now, Lee and Tom were licensed international private investigators. They had a company called Intercept, and they had international licenses, and they could go into files, government files, and get information that I could not. I wanted to get them involved if I could. They flew over, we went over the sites again, and they said, my God, this guy has got to be taking the real thing. And that's how we all became really involved in spending our own money going back to Switzerland over and over again, more than a dozen times each, as we pursued the investigation, collect evidence, bring it back, test it, go back to get some more evidence, verify new, new questions raised in the testing. And uh, we found that the metal uh, we, which we tested in several metallurgical laboratories, not just one. We found that the metal was unique, that it had unique properties, that most metallurgists agreed that it could not have been made on this planet. The sounds were unique. We went to the biggest sound bank in the world, the Groton Naval, Groton, Groton Naval Research, Groton Naval Sound Research Laboratory, Groton, Connecticut, run by the Navy. has all the sounds in the bank that you can get, they're computer controlled. When we put the Swiss the UFO sounds into the bank, it couldn't find a match. The piece that we put in there was the sound recorded when the jet, the Mirage jet was making passes on the, the, the alien beam ship. And the computer matched the sound of the jet engine, gave us the model of the jet and the engine it was using. It gave us a a police siren, a European police siren of a, used in, in certain countries. It gave us a, a Junkers Ju-52 flying in the area, which we didn't hear on the tape. I didn't hear it. Meyer didn't hear it, but it was there. They gave us a, 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 a report, it reported that a, a Swiss pilota, Pilatus Porter reconnaissance plane was in the vicinity and also recorded the sounds of the jet engine. Gave us all of this information, including that of a, of a barking dog which we could hear the barking dog, but a lot of sound information that was imperceptible to us was all discovered by the sound bank. So that was quite unique. And, and then when we took it to sound technicians to find out what kind of sound it was, they, they, they had some problems. They couldn't find out how many emitters were involved. One idea there was eight, another concept was that there were 24 simultaneous emitters to produce the sound. The sound had random wavelength and random uh, uh, what's the other amplitude of the waves, both at the same time. And this was something that would be relatively impossible to do. They concluded that it would take 24 separate synthesizers working together to reproduce the sound. Now those synthesizers are very expensive equipment and no laboratory had more than one. The biggest laboratory in the world at, at Groton only had two. Let's go class by. Um, you investigated the Hasenbohl photo site and you spoke to the farmer. What did you find out about the Hasenbohl picture? You know, the three. Yeah. And <coughs> okay, uh, I, I took Mr. Meyer back. When we were going back to the photo sites, and I was going, this time I was alone with him, uh, the first time, <coughs> and we went to the Hasenbohl site, I found that we had to go through two locked fences. The first one was to get to the farmer, farmer's house. And the second one was to get through the fence in the back to the pasture, and they both had locked gates. So we had to make a noise in the front to attract the farmer's interest or his attention to unlock the first gate. And as he's pre unlocking the second gate, I asked him if he had ever seen this man before, Mr. Meyer. He looked at him and said, yes, I've seen him before. I said, uh, does he come by here very often? He said, no, it was as, about two years ago that he was here. 
And I said, uh, do you remember anything about it? He said, only that I had to unlock two fences for him. And he said, you know, I don't get a lot of people to come through these fences. And I said, Can, do you remember what he looked like? He said, oh, yes, same man. I said, was he wearing a jacket or not? He said he was wearing a jacket. I said, did he have anything else on the moped with him? He said he had a brown bag, like, which he presumed to be a lunch bag, and a, and a photo camera with him. And I said, did he have any poles or wires or rods or fishing poles or anything like that? No. Did he have a model tree? No. Did he have a, a model of any kind? Oh, no, he didn't have room to carry that. He, he was driving the moped with one hand. And I said, uh, uh, and he came through here and you unlocked the gate for him at that time, both gates, and let him in and you let him out. I said, how long was he in there? He said he was there about two hours. So then we went up to the site. Now, when we're going up to the site, it's a very steep climb up that hill. And Mr. Meyer had to run his moped engine and run the moped in gear and push at the same time to get it up the hill. When we rented a four-wheel drive Jeep to go up the same hill, the, the four-wheel drive Jeep just skidded and slid back, wouldn't climb it. So if he's carrying anything, he's not going to get it up the hill that way. He's going to have to make several trips. All the ascent was in full view of the far that farmer's house. He could have looked out his window and see him going all the way up the hill to the shoulder. You were a witness of an assassination attempt against Mr. Meyer. Can you tell me the story? Yes, <clears throat> I can tell you about the assassination attempt. I was in Billy's house. I had taken a translation of the contact notes back to him to, for corrections. And we had been in his living room there, reading them and making corrections a long time, four or five hours, since two o'clock, well, later than that, about four o'clock in the afternoon, all the way through supper, and it was up about 10 o'clock at night, and he said, I must go out and have a cigarette. And so we went outside to sit down in the fresh air, and there was a car seat beside the door, and we sat down on the car seat. And just as we sat down with Mr. Meyer right by my left shoulder, He was suddenly pulled across my lap like that. He went, Ugh! and he started to get up again like that. I said, what's the matter? Are you having a heart attack? And about the time that he was pulled across my lap, we felt debris in our hair. And I thought that it was a rat in the rafters of, of the barn there. And at that time, we heard the shot. We've already been sprinkled with, with, with sand. And then we heard the shot. He said, that was a shot. And he turned around and looked, and there's a whole, fresh hole in the wall. He put his finger in it, and he says, it's hot. And he says, let's find the bullet. And he got up and pulled this, the car seat out to find the bullet behind the car seat. I, I'm thinking, why are we doing this? The gunman's still out there. Why don't we crawl inside and get some, something to protect ourselves? And he, so we went in, and we got a big flashlight and a rifle and came out. And when we went to the point the shot, the noise came from, We found where the ground had been packed down. Somebody had been standing out there, shifting his feet like this for some time. And after the shot, there were running steps leaving the scene. I quickly changed the tape before we... Intelligence in the Billy Meyer case. Well, <laughs> it's strange you ask that because... Uh, and they would pay their tickets and I would pay mine. Now, those agreements were reached on the telephone. And we set a date and we went to Los Angeles and caught a Laker airline The old Laker airline, airline company did not have regular schedules. They sold tickets, filled an airplane, and then it went. Airliner and went through the terminal there and down to the subway in Heathrow, subway into town, into London. Now that subway leaves every five minutes, so we could have been on any of a dozen of those trains coming in from the airport. When we got to Victoria Station, got off the subway, and went up to the railroad starting platform where you catch the taxis. We were heading for the taxi exit where there's a long line of black London taxis standing there. You're supposed to take the taxi in front and the next ones move up. As we were walking there, we stopped to look at uh, some fruits in a kiosk, to decide whether we were going to buy something or not before we got to a, into a taxi. And a big black taxi driver, tall fellow, big husky guy came up to Lee Elder's tapped him on the shoulder and said, you're Mr. Elders? And he said, yes, he said, I have your taxi. And he motioned for us to follow him. So we went out the door and the other taxi drivers are start yelling because we're following a taxi driver that should be on the front line and he's not. He took us around the end of the taxi line down another side street a little ways out of sight of the taxi line and 
put us in another black taxi that was standing there. And I told him we were going down, we'd like to go down to, to uh, Kensington. We have an, a, an apartment arranged in Kensington. He said, yep, nodded, spoke our kind of English. He was, he was an American black taxi driver in London. So instead of, we didn't know London very well at the time, and he drove around a little bit and pulled up at a big hotel, parked in the only unloading spot in, under the canopy there with a doorman standing there, got out of the taxi and motioned for us to get out. We said, we uh, want to go down to, tex to Kensington. He said, oh, we get down there. And he motioned for us to get out, and he locked the ca taxi cab and took us in the hotel. He said, we, I want you to meet somebody. And we, he took, was leading us to the elevators. And we said, what about our stuff in the taxi? He said, oh, these men will watch it. There were some men sitting there. So we went up the elevator to a room, fifth floor, went down a corridor to about the third room on the left, and he knocked on the door. And the door was open to crack, and it was fastened with a chain. You couldn't open any farther. A patient looked out, they said something, and the man inside took the chain off and, and led us into what looked like a very small kitchen. It had a, a sink, a range, a stove, and a refrigerator on one side, and a, a, several cabinets on the other side, and a door at the end. He took us to the door at the end, opened it, said something to somebody inside, and motioned for us to go in. We went in, and there was a man sitting at a big overstuffed chair inside. Now, I'm going to back up a minute because I want to tell you how we happened to get there. After, we de after they agreed to go back with me, uh, and we had picked a date about a month in advance when we could all be ready at the same time. And that's our last conversation on the telephone. We de at, at that point, we began to suspect that so our telephones were monitored because we'd get strange noises on them. So we agreed if any... If we were going to communicate, we would just say, meet you at the usual place, and we'd go to, half, they would drive to Picacho Peak, halfway between their residence in Phoenix and mine in Tucson. And we'd talk there. We could drive up the side of the peak and see all access roads. So we did that for all communications before we left, after we agreed that we would, would go together. But shortly after this, within about 10 days after our last telephone call in, in that area, uh, Lee got a letter in the mail, air mail from London, and the upper left-hand corner in, a, in silver ink was stamped Knights Templars of Malta, and an address and uh, letters, uh, uh, telephone numbers. He opened the letter. Inside was, uh, this was blue parchment, pale blue parchment, very expensive paper. Inside was one sheet of the matching, very expensive blue parchment, with uh, silver letters stamped on the top, Knights Templars of Malta, the headquarters of Knights Templars of Malta. And there was a, a one paragraph letter under that that said, Dear Mr. Elders, we believe we have interests in common. When you get to Europe, please call us at this number. And he called me and said, let's meet at the regular place. And uh, the, that letter, by the way, was signed, Mark Nathan, General Secretary of the Knights Templars of Malta. So we agreed to meet at Picacho and he was going to show me the letter and we decided there that we wouldn't respond to it because we didn't need any help from anybody. We didn't want any interference. And so we decided to forget that. Well, another two weeks passed. We're only a week before leaving. He got another letter from London, this time a white parchment, fine white parchment with gold stamping in the upper left-hand corner. The House of Commons, on House of Commons stationery. Inside was a sheet of House of Commons stationery with a re another short paragraph that said, you did not respond to my last letter. I uh, am convinced that we have interests in common. It's very important that you get in touch with me at this telephone number. If not before you leave Arizona, please do so when you reach Europe, when you get to England. So we met again, discussed that, and decided we're not going to answer that one either. That letter was also signed, Mark Nathan, Secretary something, it wasn't Secretary General, but it was the head secretary, chief secretary of the House of Commons. So now we've got a dilemma. We've got the Secretary General of the Knights Templars writing us on stationery using Mark Nathan, and another letter from the same Mark Nathan, same signature on House of Commons stationery. So we think, boy, this is really interesting. This guy's got a real collection of stationery. We still weren't interested in communicating with him. 
So now we've arrived at London Station and the big black cabbie has taken us to his cab and driven us to a parking spot in front of a, a very big, a big, very expensive hotel where movie stars live. He parked the cab in front and locked it. Those cabs, they just unload there and they move on. So that was kind of strange to us in the first place to get out of a cab and lock it in the only parking spot they've got under the canopy in front of the hotel. So now we get down to the room and we're being ushered into the room and the, there's a man sitting there, a, a short, stocky fella, uh, in front of a big black overstuffed chair, a big black leather chair in the corner and he had a table on either side, a white phone on one side, a red phone on the other, and there was a long four seat four cushion sofa on one side with a big heavy coffee table in front of it and a shorter three cushion sofa at right angles to that with another coffee heavy coffee table in front of it. The man is standing up when we come in and 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 as we turn to him and and uh, waiting for a greeting he greets us and he says I'm Mark Nathan and we look at each other and we wonder whether we're in the office of the Secretary General of the Knights Templars or whether we're in the office of the Secretary of the House of Commons. Anyway, we start to set down and the white telephone rang 10 short rings. I looked at Lee and he looked at me. We've heard that at Bailey Meyer's house, but Lee is in that communications business and we knew, he'd already told me, that mechanical telephones cannot ring 10 short rings. They only have six, cam six lobes on the cam and they can ring six rings in combinations of short rings or long rings, but only six rings on a mechanical telephone. Here we had 10 short rings. And the, the, the fellow at the chair, Mark Nathan, picked it up to answer it. There's nobody on the line. There was a, a number of questions about how the, the phone could ring if it didn't come from the, through the switchboard. The switchboard said there was no lights on the switchboard. Nobody called. He asked, can anybody else call in without going through the switchboard? No way. Can they call to this room from any other room? They said, not your room. It's a discreet line. And he put that one down, and just as he put it down and started to talk, the red phone rang, 10 short rings. He picked that up and tried to answer it. She got the same response, and he turned to us and he said, this is impossible. He said, this is a secure phone. It's monitored round the clock forever. He says, this is never without a switchboard operator. And he says, they, she says that there was no call. And he says, I don't understand because this can't be called either. This is a direct line from a, a control switchboard where there's an operator on duty all the time. So then we told him what we thought the 10 short rings probably meant. That was a signal that the Palladians used to convince Meyer that what he was thinking was a telepathic transmission and not his, his idle thoughts and they would confirm the telepathic transmission until he learned to recognize the difference, and then those, that signal discontinued. But we heard it in his house a number of times, so we knew what it was. Now, that was unique. The fact that Mark Nathan was interested was very unique. He was now characterized us as the secretary of two different agencies, and then he announces that he, is, I'm, he says, I am the case officer of the London district. Well, in... CIA jargon, that means that he is the, the top CIA officer in charge of the L London area. The case officer is a senior man. Now this was strange because here we are sitting in the top office of American intelligence in that part of the world. And uh, uh, we wondered what their interests might be, why we're there, and now we realize that he's the one that was sending the letters that came before we left and shortly after we agreed to, to go together as a team. So he st starts the conversation and he says, we, uh, we know where you're going. He says, we are very interested in the group there. He says, we've tried to, to, get, to penetrate the group, but he says they're too close, too well known to each other. We haven't been able to get anybody inside. He says, we'd like you to look for a few things. Would you mind? And of course, we're in a prisoner in his office, so we say, no, we don't mind. He told us what he would like to look for, just a very few simple things like uh, the number of people that come and go, uh, whether they carry cameras or tape recorders, who they talk to. And we told him we weren't going to keep notes, but if, if we could remember anything, we would, would contact him when we got out. And he asked us again if we'd be sure and contact him on the way out, and we agreed to do so. But when we left his office, we agreed that we are not going to 
play their game and we are not going to come back through his office again. Then he drove us down to Kensington, his, his chauffeur in the black taxi drove us down to Kensington and to the place where we had the reservation and you know, they already knew where, where we were going. We didn't have to give him the address. So that means that uh, the, our telephone called uh, to that telephone number in London, a number that we got out of Fromer's London on $10 a day that was five or six years old at the time. But we did get through and the old gunner answered and he, he agreed to rent us a room on our dates there in his walk up in a row house, row flats. So anyway, we're now in, in London and we're leaving, he drives us back and we're, we're on our way to Switzerland. And uh, we, I can tell you now that we never got in or out at any time without being abducted by our own intelligence agency and taken to Mark Nathan's office. By the fourth trip, we've been through his office six times already. And he tells us, we're getting on a first name basis. He calls me Steve, he calls Lee, Lee and he calls Britt, Britt. We call him Mark and uh, he, 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 the, the next time after that, about the eighth trip we were through, he had his wife sitting at his desk when we came, when they picked us up and drove us to his office. So he knew when we were coming because she was there waiting with him. Then he introduced us to his wife and we met her and, and uh, it was a cordial meeting and so then she left and we talked and, and uh, he sent us back to the gunner's house and we made our own way home. Now the next time, we came through, which was about the tenth time we were in his office on the way out. He said, look, my wife has prepared a nice dinner for you folks tonight. Will you come to my house and have dinner with us? So he said, I'll send, we told him uh, we need to, to go to the, our room and, and clean up. He said, okay, I'll send the limousine for you at six o'clock and, uh, and he'll take you back afterwards. So leave your things at the house. So the limousine arrived right on time, very punctual. And he drove us to the to this case officer to Mark Nathan's apartment in another place in the city. And we got out and his wife, him and his wife were waiting at the door. They escorted us in. She had a nice Chinese dinner prepared and very nice table service laid out with wine glasses and silver, china plates and everything. And we had a, a, nice, a nice dinner served by his wife who was a full-blooded Chinese from the People's Republic of China. She was also an intelligence agent in the People's Republic of China before she married him, and I suspect probably still was. So they served us dinner there, and afterwards he took us into a parlor and offered Lee and I cigars and, and poured wine for the women. And he said, remember the letter? I told you uh, I thought we had interests in common. And Lee said, yeah, what kind of interests? He said, let me show you. And he came over to the sofa where I was sitting, and at the end of the sofa was a, a coffee table or a, a lamp table, a lamp table with a big lamp on it. He came over and lifted the big lamp off and set it on the floor. Then he picked up the table, which turned out to be a shell, a hollow shell, and set it over on the floor by the lamp. It was an eight-sided table. And under that was a safe, a big heavy safe, filled the whole table area, bolted to, the, to a set cement slab in the floor. He knelt down and twirled the dials and unlocked the safe. And he took out some things, among which was a package of passports, I would guess eight passports bundled together with a rubber band. Lee says, those all yours? He said, yeah. And he tossed them to Lee, and Lee took the rubber band off. He had a Canadian one, he had a, a British one, he had an American one, he had a, one from India, he had one from Australia, one from Canada. And Lee said, do you, what do you do with all these? He said, well, I travel a lot. <laughs> so the next thing he, he, he took out was a, uh, a, a paper bag and then a couple other things and then he took out a blue eight and a half by eleven booklet it was about a half an inch thick bound on the left side with a with a black binder and the cover was blue with a red stripe that ran diagonally from the upper right to the lower left and uh, it was stamped eyes only and he laid that on the floor and he says uh, and he put something else on top of it right after that then he he took out a paper bag that was behind that and tossed that to Lee. He says, what do you think of those? And when Lee opened them and looked in, he saw miniaturized equipment. He saw miniaturized transmitters that and it looked like an eraser on a lead pencil. You could pull the eraser out of a lead pencil, put this false eraser in, it had a little metal sticker that stuck out of it, just 
just above the eraser and he said this would transmit up to 500 feet and you have to pick it up and retransmit it. There were other things like that, other miniature transmitters that could be put in almost anything. There was a brooch that had a camera in a brooch that a woman could wear uh, 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 around her neck. Uh, there were other things like uh, in there, uh, uh, miniaturized things. And he says, and Lee says, boy, technology's gone a long ways. I didn't know these things were that small. He says, they're going to be even smaller soon. So then that discussion being over, he put the paper bag in. Then he put the blue booklet with the red stripe across the cover in. Then he put the passports in on top of that and some, then some other small things on top of, of the rest of the blue booklet and closed the door, locked it, put the shell back over the safe and put the lamp back on the table. About that time, we, we told him that we were tired and, and would like to go home. And he said, it was about 11.30 anyway. And so he said, the limousine is waiting outside and they drove us back. We got back to the gunner's walk up flat. He had a, he had a, a row house that had five levels in it, and no elevator, a walk-up. Inside the door at the ground level, the door was a big, heavy door that was closed with a heavy oak bar into the, 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 par, the entrance, the foyer. In that foyer was a big dog that he kept in there when he closed for the night. He closed for the night at 10 o'clock. After that, you had to ring the bell, and he had to come get the dog and put him in the back, then lift the big bar then unlocked the door and let us in. Then he locked the door again, put the bar back on it. He had a, a locked gate at two levels going up the stairs, so which separated the stairs. You had to ring, push a button and ring a bell to, to change levels in his walk-up. So he went and unlocked both gates and let us go up the stairs to the, to the top floor where we were. Lee and Britt had a room on one side and I had one on the other. Those were the only rooms on the top floor. So I went in their room with them and, and they were tired and Lee started taking his shirt off and then he he took his, he emptied his pockets onto the top of a metal shift robe. A shift robe is a cabinet that holds clothes, a metal cabinet that holds clothes. And he put his keys up there with a clang and he dumped a handful of change up there and then he put his wallet from his rear pocket up there. Then he started taking his pants off, and I said, okay, I get to end. I'm going over to my room. I'm going to take a bath tonight so we can get up early for breakfast in the morning. You know, we always get there after the table is all dirty. Let's get there early this time and get, it, get, get, get the first stuff nice and clean. He said, okay. So I, I get up early anyway. He always sleeps later. So I got up early, and I was restless, and I went over and knocked on his door about 5 o'clock in the morning. And he's, I heard a sleepy voice, I said, oh, God, and he got up, came to the door, and uh, he had sleep in his eyes, hair all over his head, and he opened a little crack, he said, no, not that, and I said, yeah, you said you'd go. He said, oh, all right, and he opened the door, and he went in and started putting water to the sink, and splashed water in his face to wake up. Then he sat down and put his shoes on, then he put his shirt on, pulled his pants on, and then turned around to the shiffer robe, to pick up his change, first he picked up the wallet, put it in his back pocket, then he picked up the change, put it in his pocket, and he's looking at where the keys were, then he picked up the keys, he says, what's this? And I said, man, it looks like that blue book in Mark Nathan's safe at his house. It was the blue book with the eyes only, stamping on it, a signature sheet if you looked at it, a red stripe across from upper left, to upper right to lower left. So. I, he said, did you bring it? I said, no. We saw him lock it in the safe. He said, I didn't bring it. He said, we better wake Britt up. So we went over and woke Britt up, showed her what was there, and she said, oh, my God, you better call you better call Mark. So we went down the stairs. We had to get the gunner to unlock the gate again so we could get to the telephone between levels. And we went down and called Mark Nason at 5 o'clock in the morning. He was sleepy when he came to the phone. We told him that we had his blue book from his safe, and he, he thought we were joking. He says, oh, he says, I can't stand that this time of day. Go on back to bed. We said, you better go look, because we've got your book right here. He said, that's impossible. He said, they locked the safe and drove you home. We said, we'll hold the phone. Go check, because we do have your book. So he said, oh, okay, just a minute. And he wandered away from the phone. When he came back a few minutes later, he was out of breath. He was hyperventilating, puffing. He said, yeah, yeah. You, you really got it? He says, it's not in the safe. He says, what does it look like? So we described it again. He says, impossible. He says, don't touch it. Don't touch it. I'll be right there. And he got in his limousine and raced over there. He arrived in 10 minutes. 
quarter of the way across London, drove up in front, kept running up the stairs. We told the gunner he was coming. He had the door unlocked, unbarred and unlocked the dog inside. He came running in and he said, oh man, he said, I, he said, let me see. So we took him up and really still getting in bed there. She hadn't got up yet. She's waiting for, the, for us to clear out so she could take a shower. So he came in and he looked on the, on the shift robe and he says, oh my God, he said, that's the book. He says, it's not in the safe. And there it is. He said, look, tell me, just how did you do this? And we told him we didn't do it. We don't know how it got here. He said, there must be some trick involved. He said, how was it done? We don't know. So he just shook his head. He took the book. He said, you sure you didn't look in it? And we said, no. No, OK. Oh, I just dropped it on the ground. Continue. Let's continue. He said, OK. OK. Something wrong. He said, are you sure you didn't look in it? We said, no, it's none of our business. It has nothing to do with us. Why would we look at it? He said, oh, God, he said, uh, I'll have to take your word for it because there's nothing I can do anyway. And he took his book and, and thanked us for not looking in it, if we had not, and said that uh, he would like us to check in with him before we left town. So we were <laughs> at the getting ready to take the subway up to Victoria, uh, out to Heathrow Airport to leave. And a big black taxi driver comes up to us. He says, the boss wants to see you before you go. We drove us back to the Grosvenor Hotel, uh, hotel and, and back up to the room. And he says, look, he said, I've been thinking about this. He said, I don't know what's going on here. But he said, uh, this, there's something really strange involved. And we said, well, we'd like, if you find out, we'd like to know what it's all about. Because we didn't do it. And the only thing I can think of is apporting, and that's a spiritual phenomena that I'm not familiar with and can't explain. He said, well, I've had experts consulted on this, and that's the only thing they can come up with, is somebody apported it out. And so they, they were, he was very concerned. But we never managed to get either into Switzerland or out of Switzerland without being picked up by our CIA people. We found out later that they had agents with us all the time. When we traveled on the train, there was an agent in, in the car on either side of us supposed to keep track of us. And uh, we never got on a boat without agents on the boat with us. When we stayed in the guest house in Switzerland, there were agents in, in, in one case, the guest house was alone on its side of the street with a hospital and, and a, a, a private home. They had rented in the, the room facing our guest house and the hospital was the maternity recovery room. They had rented the maternity recovery room and put two agents in there and they had two agents in the, in the residence on the other side with a bedroom w room looking out towards our guest house that watched us go and come all the time and watched the guest house while we were gone. And we, were, we knew that we were being followed when we were in traffic. One time, we were driving a, a rented car and a, a, a big, heavy, black truck came up alongside and then swerved into us as though it was going to force us off the road. And almost immediately, another carryall came up from behind and hit the back truck in the, in the rear end, bumped it in the rear end and forced the black truck ahead of us, and, and, and they both took off down the road. And the only thing we can think of is, is that some of his agents were in the other truck and they didn't want interference with whatever was going on. When the, you were present when Billy um, got some messages regarding uh, the death of uh, the last pope. I was present at his house. That's an interesting case because this is clearly beyond mortal control. I was there alone this time, and I had been at the at the household for three or four days already. And uh, on this fourth day, Billy was—I well, think it was about the fourth day. Billy was—he got up feeling not feeling very ill. He was—he had—he had a bad case of cold and flu combination. It looked like. He, he came out to the kitchen, he didn't light a cigarette, he didn't drink any coffee. He looked around, he felt dizzy, he went in the living room and laid down on the sofa in front of the television set and watched the news. And he was, apparently was beginning to feel worse and worse because he didn't call for anything, he didn't light a cigarette, he didn't ask for coffee. The women took a glass of water in there, he didn't even sip the, set it on the coffee table in front of the sofa. He didn't even sip the water. And he was there most of the day, and I was in and out at, during that time. And about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was back in the living room, standing in front of the television set, watching for the news to come up. 
and the news started and I heard a noise behind and Billy looked like he was sleeping at the time. And I was trying to be very quiet not to disturb him and and I had turned the volume way down on the television set and I heard a noise behind me and I look around and it was Billy and he was motioning very weakly like this. And I went over there and I says, What can I do for you, Billy? He said, Get Elsie. Get Elsie. So I went and got Elsie and she came in and leaned down, and he whispered something to her. She went and got his wife Poppy. They came back and picked him up by the armpits and walked him down the hall to his bedroom. And they took him in the bedroom and evidently put him in a tub uh, to take a bath. Then they came out with, uh, Elsie came out with uh, a, a Levi pants and, and a shirt. And his wife came out with boots and they started polishing the boots. First they cleaned them, then polished them. Then they, they ironed the Levi pants and, and ironed the shirt. About that time, his wife took the shirt back in, to, pants and shirt both back into him in the bedroom and the boots. And a few minutes later, he came out wearing the boots and the pants and the shirt with the long sleeve. His wife pinned the sheet sleeve up while Elsie looked for a jacket. They, it had been raining all night the night before. It had been raining all day this day, and it was still raining in this afternoon. And they were looking for a jacket that would shed water. And they couldn't find a cap. They were looking for a headgear of some kind to protect his head because he's sick. But he was looking a lot better after the bath and he was standing alone. And uh, so uh, uh, they found one of those Air Force B5 jackets or B4 jackets. It's a blue nylon jacket with a, a, a blue fleece collar. Keep it a little bit shorter. Okay. So they, he put the jacket on. They didn't have a cap. While they're looking for a jacket, he comes out, he brings his holster and a walkie-talkie with him. He took the gun out of the holster, dumped the bullets out, looked through it, put the bullets back in, put it in the holster, put it on his, buckled it on. He took the, bat the back off the walkie-talkie, dumped the batteries out, put fresh batteries in it, else he ran upstairs, and they checked with the base station. Everything was working. So now he's all ready to go, and he's standing in front of the stove talking to Elsie and, and Poppy, and I've gone over to the sink to make a, pour a cup of coffee. About that time, the work people that worked there work came back in. They were coming in from work, and and so uh, Mrs. Meyer started setting dinner on the table. And they washed up, and they came out, and they all sat down to eat. This was about six o'clock, six fifty-one, maybe six fifteen. About that time, they spent an hour eating, and Billy waited. He didn't eat anything. He he's standing there waiting for things to happen. Doesn't know when it's going to start. And they finished eating, and then some of the women picked up the dishes and carried them away. And uh, Billy is still waiting, and I, I have got to, I've got to make a comment on that man's patience. He is the, has the patience of Job. He, he waited two and a half hours after, after he was ready for the contact to come. I know that he waited as many as five or six hours at, at rendezvous. But anyway, he's waiting, they're waiting, he's not living, he's losing his patience, he's waiting there, and I'm losing my patience. I poured another cup of coffee when he got his signal, and he raised his hand like that in a little goodbye salute and started out the door. As he did that, I could see over his head the cook stove here and the round clock on the wall above the cook stove, and I could see that it was 8.25, 25 minutes after 8. He started out the door. I set the coffee down and raced around the table. To, I want to see him go. I don't want to miss anything. I'm going to wait. All right. Okay. I didn't want to miss anything, so I set my and, and and he got made his little salute and started out the door. I could see then that it was now 8:25, and and I looked at the clock because he was passing right in front of it, going out that side door there. And I raced around that table on leg, the door on leg, oak legs, and out the the, the lean-to door into the shed. There was a dog chained here, the big dog, and he lunged at me because. He, was, he didn't know me too well, and I was moving fast and strange to him, and, and his chain had him restrained, so he just couldn't quite get to me, but he scared the dickens out of me. I jerked away like that, and then out the door, in time to see, get on the ground outside, in time to see the end door, eight steps from me, eight, nine steps from me, closing on Billy's heels. I saw his heels going out, and the door slammed, it sprung loaded inside, and it slammed shut, and I ran the steps and jerked the door open as quick as I could, and you know what? When I, I expected to see Billy out there, and when I looked out, there was no Billy. There was one, two, three steps in the mud. The fresh steps, the mud had been just squished out, and water was just starting to run back into the footprints. Raindrops were bouncing in all the little puddles all around there, and it was quiet. There were no flashing lights. There was no sound. 
There was nothing but the three footsteps and nothing else. If he had backed up, he would have backed right into me. If he tried to jump sideways, the jump was too far for any man to make. It was about 20 feet either side of the, the last muddy print to the side of the house or anything else. There was nothing to swing on, no ropes hanging down, nothing to get a hold of, and he's gone. Absolutely quiet out there, just a little noise of the raindrops. So I came back in, I got all wet waiting. I, don't, I missed him going and I don't want to miss him coming back. Came back in and I, got, I changed clothes and got a raincoat, went back out again. But as I came down the stairs with the raincoat on, dry clothes, I noticed all the Germans in the living room standing in front of the television set. So I went in and looked over their shoulders to see what they were looking at. And the screen was black with a white cross and white letters that said in German, the Pope has died. Was Papa, the father has passed or something like that. So I said, how did he die? And they said, hasn't been any announcements. The program just stopped and this came up on the screen and the music, the music was funeral music, dirge music. So I watched for maybe a minute and then I was afraid I'd miss his return and I went back outside and stood in the rain for another half hour. And about uh, 10 minutes, but more than that, about 20 minutes after nine. Boy, we got a lot of... Too loud and I have to change the battery. So I was waiting outside uh, in the rain. I'd, I'd waited out there about a half an hour. It was now about 9.15 when I heard that... Start, start from the beginning. Um, but, but to put it in a condensed version, but you know, Billy went out for contact, you looked after him, he had disappeared, and um, people were waiting just, you know, to put it in a nutshell. Okay. Very, very quick. All right. So on this particular night, and I don't remember the date exactly, I think it was the 8th of September, October of 78, uh, that I was there, and, and B Billy had received his summons to a contact. And as he went out the door, I noticed the cl on the clock that it said 825, and I followed him out, and I had just missed him. He, he was gone when I got out the door and I was only a few steps behind him, just the three steps in the mud, water filling the steps and bouncing in the raindrops. And I, I, I waited out there after changing clothes for another half hour. Ha oh, you want me to go through the scene in the living room again? Okay, now from the very beginning. And say that, you know, he had disappeared. Yeah. Just make sure that he disappeared, that yeah. people really understand he disappeared. Oh, okay. Again, from the beginning. Okay, so I came downstairs with dry clothes and uh, oh, from the very big oh, okay, all right. So I was, I was at the home of Billy Meyer on, I think it was the 8th of August or September 1978 in the evening, and, and he had been summoned for a contact. We'd been waiting for hours. Finally, he got the, the signal, and he raised his little hand in a salute, started out the door. I noticed there had gone a clock, a round clock over the cook stove and over his head that it was 8.25 when he went out the door. I followed him out as quickly as I could and when I and it went into a lean-to and then to a door eight or ten steps from that, an outside door, and I saw it closing on his heels. I ran and jerked it open. I don't want to miss anything and when I, when I looked out there was three steps in the mud, no fourth step. The water was just starting to run into the, the, the fresh footsteps in the muddy street and he was gone. No sound, no noise, no flashing lights no place he could have gone there was he couldn't have jumped to the side it was 25 or 30 feet either direction nothing to swing away out of the scene on nothing to get away i even went to the corner of the house and looked around there's no footprints there so uh i got i waited out there until i got soaking wet came back in changed clothes went down with the raincoat to go back out when i saw all the germans in the living room looking at the television set i went in and looked over their shoulder to see what they were looking at and the screen, the set was quiet. There was a, a black screen with a white cross on it and white words that said, the Pope has died. I said, how did he die? And they said, there has been no announcement yet. The program just stopped and this picture and the music came up on the screen. So I watched for maybe a minute, a minute and a half, and then I went back out. I missed him going and I don't want to miss him coming back. So I was out there for an, over a half an hour again, still waiting in the rain when there was a telephone ring upstairs. Somebody raised the window, looked out and said, he's down around the mountain. And, and, and he, want, he says, you can come with Jacobus and his wife to pick him up. And they're already getting ready and they come right out the door after that. And we get in the black Volkswagen drive through, splashing rain, mud puddles, rain was, some of the puddles were so heavy, rain splashed all over the windshield and the top of the car, driving to get Billy. And it was 18 kilometers away and when we got there, Billy was standing under those two or three little boards of uh, the side entrance of a guest house, 
and he didn't have any rain on him. His hair wasn't wet, no rain on his jacket, no mud on his shoes, just on the edges where he, he couldn't have walked very far. And the boots were shiny, and he obviously had not been out in the weather. It had been raining all this time. And uh, he got in the car. He didn't seem much inclined to talk. I tried to start the conversation. I said, and, and he didn't respond. I said, uh, the, uh, did you hear, have you, do you know about the Pope? And he didn't answer. I said, they, they don't know how he died. It's just an announcement on the screen, just a symbol on the screen. He said, he turned around, he said, his pump failed. And I said, oh my God, heart attack? He said, no, not heart attack. Then he wouldn't answer. We got to the house and he got out and went inside and the jury motioned and all the Germans followed him, in, followed him into the living room. They closed the door. That told me that I wasn't invited. So I stayed in the kitchen, had more coffee. And after an, over an hour of this, I decided to go upstairs and go to bed. I didn't know how long the meeting would last. When I came down the next morning, I made some coffee press, the first one up. And then Madeline came down the stairs. I said, what time did the meeting break up last night? She said, not last night, this morning. I said, what time? She said, six o'clock. So I know I'm gonna to have to wait a little while for Billy to get up. When he finally did, about 10 o'clock, they fixed him a cup of coffee and he jerked his head for me to follow him outside. We went down and sat out and sat on the patio at a metal table with metal chairs. And I said, "What? can you tell me what happened last night in the contact? He said, I watched them murder a pope. I said, I'm protesting. I said, oh, the, no, it can't be. They don't murder popes. He, I said, he, he died last night, but all, all right, but he wasn't murdered. And uh, there was still no announcement up to this time of the cause of death. Even in the mor on the morning news, they, they, they were withholding the cause of death. And uh, he's saying, they, the, yes, they murdered this one. And I said, and I'm still protesting. I said, no, no, that can't be. That can't be. He was a he was a popular, but we don't murder popes. That's like the king of a country. He said he was murdered, and he said he gave me the name of poison that was used. He said I watched it all on viewing screens aboard the, the craft. He was he was aboard the craft the whole time. He watched it on viewing screens. He said that the the, the pope's manservant was preparing his bedtime tea, which was a custom that that pope drank warm tea when he went to bed, preparing his bedtime tea in the kitchen. And he had the tray prepared and he went around into a closet to get a napkin to put on the tray. A cardinal standing in the kitchen watching him do this took a little bottle out of his pocket, put a couple drops of clear liquid into the tea, put the bottle back in his pocket and stepped back. The manservant came out, put the napkin on the tray and carried it in and put it on the table beside the Pope's bed and he drank his tea and went to bed and died a few minutes later. I said, what? He's, and, and I said, my God, what kind of poison could that be? And he says, they tell me, told me it was such and such, and he gave me a name which I don't remember. He said, they told me that it was a, a very potent poison that was highly volatile and would evaporate out of the body in about five minutes in the heat of the blood. And I thought, oh my God, what kind of poison is that? He said, only, only it's, it's a very special poison, you can't buy it. It's, it's, it's manufactured for use. And uh, I said, but, Oh, it can't be. He's, and I keep protesting. He says, and I can tell you another thing. Now, he's defending himself. He says, I can tell you that the next pope will be elected in the biggest conclave in the history of the church and the shortest conclave in the history of the church. He'll be elected on the third ballot. It'll take 31 or 33 minutes to count the ballot. He'll reign the same number of days and die by the same hands. I thought, oh, now I've got some proof. If this happens, I know beforehand. So I went in, sat down, and made a, wrote myself a, a long note of what we just discussed. There were other things in the discussion that I'm not liber at liberty to release, but he, it, and I'm still protesting, so he went a little further, and he said that Pope, when he's elected, will choose the name John Paul I. And I thought, I didn't know at the time that Popes cho chose, cho they choose their own papal name when they're elected. So the, the uh, uh, conclave came off a few days later, and that pope did choose the name John Paul I. But I'm still protesting there on the patio. They're still the next morning. And I said, no, it, it, I, Billy, I can't believe all this. I said, it, it's, it's just impossible. We don't murder popes. He said, I can tell you another thing. He said, the next pope will be elected from outside of the Vatican hierarchy to keep him from finding out what happened. He's already told me that the reason for the, the death of the first uh, of Pope John Paul was because 
the Vatican Treasury had lost hundreds of millions of dollars in favor in unfavorable investments, and uh, that he had discovered it was had, had prepared a, a news release was going to call for an investigation the next day, and that's why he had to die that night. And he Meyer said that he had the papers on his desk. They showed me the papers on his desk, and he said a cardinal. And he gave me the name of the cardinal came in from the from the door into the Pope's private office, picked up the papers, make the, the, the planned news release and the, the papers he was going to use to show him that the, the Vatican had lost money and carried them out and closed the door. And he said, uh, he, and I'm still protesting, but they, we don't murder popes. And he said that uh, uh, this new pope will be, uh, will come from an East Bloc country he will be kept on the road by the Vatican as much as possible. He'll be known as the traveling pope because of the time he will be away from the Vatican. He said, I was shown there'd be a very good reason for this is to keep him from discovering that the two previous popes have been murdered and the reason why. And then he told me another thing. He said, if this pope discovers the reason or suspects that the murders have taken place and chooses to act in any way, he'll die by the same hand. If he is wise enough not to act, he will live out his normal lifetime. So he said, that is not clear what will happen. He said, that's up to the Pope. And uh, as we know, he's still, there's, nobody has been accused of murder in the Vatican. The same officers sit in the Vatican and the Vatican hierarchy, the same prime minister or whatever the equivalent prime minister is, are still there and they are the perpetrators. And. Uh, I'm still protesting, and he went on and gave me some future things that haven't happened yet, which I'm not going to go into because he had a, made a promise that he wouldn't release, reveal information, and he had already betrayed that in re telling me what he had, and, and, and I hope, well, I've, that verified, that proved to me that what he gave me the, follow, the morning after the death was all correct right down to the last phrase, last sentence that he told me. Every fact he told me happened in sequence up to now. And I, I have another sequence that goes from here, and I'll let you know when those are confirmed. But no mortal man that I know of can do that. The Billy Meyer case was heavily debunked by a person called Karl Korff. Can you comment on Karl Korff's history and his so-called research? Well, I, I can tell you that Karl Korff first contacted me when he was in high school. And I believe he was about 16 years old. And he wrote me a letter. He had written a letter to all of the figures. He had written it to Afro, to Coral Lorenzen, to James Hynek, to Walt Andrus up in, in a MUFON chapter in Wisconsin, to NICAP, to Hayden Hughes, to a lot of people, and nobody bought it. Probably the same letter. In that letter, he said that he was doing a high school research project and he'd like some UFO material. Apparently, I was the only one that answered the letter. The rest all ignored it. So I sent him a 20-slide a, a sheet of cold slides that I, I throw away because they're, they're not good enough to do anything with them. And he thanked me and wanted some more, and I sent him a few more in a box. And he thanked me again and sent me some slides that he had, uh, pictures. And he, he, and then in that letter, he, had, he wanted me to send him some Pleiades pictures. We had already released the first picture book. And I told him that uh, we weren't, couldn't share that with other people. The present time was all under investigation. Then he took my slides and he offered them to, to Bernie O'Connor to publish in Saga magazine as a new UFO discovery of, of new UFO photographs. And <laughs> they run a feature spread of Cal Corp's pictures, which he had gotten from me. I knew Bernie O'Connor. I had furnished, I'd written articles for the magazine before. I didn't know they were looking for a photo spread. But anyway, Cal Corp sold. Then he wanted more pictures. Now I know what he's up to, and I told him, no, I. I'm not furnishing any more pictures. You're, you're selling my own pictures out from under me, and I, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's deceitful to do that. You should have told me what you intended to do with them. And then the next thing was a year later when we were in Oakland, California, where we were making the first presentation on the Swiss case in a, a Congress, a UFO Congress. And Cal Corp showed up. He's still probably 17, late, late 17, and he's wearing a a cap with a press pass sign, a handmade press pass sign in, wanting to get in free. And I asked him, what, what magazine, and we, I was thinking, Dorman, I said, what magazine are you working for? And he said, Saga. 
So I went back on the telephone, called Bernie O'Connor, and said, do you have a man out here, a press man? He said, no. He said, but if you got some good information, send me something on it. And I said, okay. And I went back and told Calcorp, they, they don't know you're here under their banner. But I said, if it's that important to you, take a seat over there with the rest of the journalists and, and write your report, you know. So I let him in free anyway, and he won on that one. And he wrote his report, but his report was an attack on the case. Now suddenly, he found that the people that wouldn't answer him before are writing him over his attack on the Meyer case, which was really a groundless attack. He was just arguing points like they were, they obviously were suspended, suspensions, suspended from a line, and a, a, a number of things that they were too dark on the bottom and obviously couldn't be uh, a, a large object distant from the camera that when it's a, a small object is close to the camera, it's always dark on the bottom. None of the arguments were valid. They weren't scientific or anything else. But the UFO clubs paid attention to him because now somebody is challenging the case. When they discovered that he was a minor under 18 years old, they began persuading him to ask uh, challenging questions that would lead to, uh, in, in fact, some of them were even uh, de uh, points of defamation, ac accusatory questions. And uh, which he did. And we decided when we got the first letter and after this, we decided we would not respond to any attacks on the case because the Palladians, while we were investigating it, had told us that we should not seek to prove the case because every human being has a point beyond which he is not comfortable to go and he creates a crutch to protect him. And they said, it's not your business to go around kicking the crutches out from under the cripples. So. They said that uh, you can't uh, you can't prove anything to a closed mind anyway, and it's a waste of, a waste of time and effort, and you just force them to make new challenges. So we decided we wouldn't rebut any challenges, and we wouldn't try to prove anything to anybody. And this was what Billy was already working under. He didn't try to prove anything to us. He offered us what he had. We could do, choose to use what we wanted to use, but he he never tried to come up with positive proof. And he said that the Palladians had even told him one time that it was not in the interest of human development to try to prove something beyond their, their, their level of acceptance. That uh, we, that's up to them. They choose, he said, every spirit walks its own path in evolution and they choose their course and they choose what they choose to be, what they want to believe. And he said, that's up to them. And it's not your business to try to change it. Didn't Karl Korf, when he was a kid, beg you to take him to Switzerland and you couldn't take him, and that's why you get very frustrated? Well, he didn't beg, but at one point he, he wanted to accompany us to Switzerland, and, uh, and uh, I asked him if he had a way to pay his way, and he said, well, I, not really, but he said, I'm a good investigator. And I, I told him we didn't need any help. In fact, we couldn't take any help. It was a closed group and we were all bound in oaths of secrecy to each other, uh, non-disclosure non, non agreements to keep it under control until we knew where it was going and what we were doing with it. And that was before he uh, wrote the letters, uh, accusing, challenging letters, accusatory letters about the case and got the attention of uh, the leaders of other UFO organizations. And he was a minor at that time? He was still a minor at the time. And when he, uh, when he turned 18, he gave it up because uh, some of the accusations were actually uh, libelous. And we couldn't proceed against a minor. You can't sue a, 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 a person under 18 years of age. You can, but you can't get it into court. And uh, when he turned 18, he stopped because he didn't want to be liable. Others were giving him challenges to make that were already adults. Bill Moore was one and a couple others to make uh, libelous challenges, trying to barb us into a response so they can make further charges. What do you think is his motivation behind the debunking campaign against Billy? Against Billy? Yeah. I think that, uh, I, I think it, most of it is jealousy uh, because we didn't take him into the investigations. I, uh, I've never been a member of any UFO organization and I didn't want to be because that kind of locked you into uh, uh, an idea pattern or into a, uh, uh, a position and I didn't want to be locked into any positions. So they'd send me cards, membership cards free, and I'd send them back. And I think that that's one reason why I was attacked by the clubs. They all 
had sent me cards at one time or another, and I am independent and and still not coordinating with the club. My my closest coordination was was with Jim and Carl Lorenzen, and I would brief them every time I got back on important points that I just learned, and they li they would listen. But after the second or third trip, Carl began to accuse me of stealing their case. And he, she reached this reasoning because Lou Zinstock brought the pictures to my house. I picked her up at the bus station. But since I was the photo expert for, for APRO and carried on their mask as their photo consultant and had their files, at least they were calling my files their files at the time, and they thought that I should have turned Lou Zinstock over to them. Well, as a matter of fact, when Lou hit my house, I said, you ought to make a courtesy call to the Lorenzans and let them know you're in town. She went to the phone and called, a, called Coral and Jim and talked to them, and she invited them to dinner at the hotel that she and Timothy were going to stay in that night in the restaurant, and they accepted it. And she, then she, she wanted to get back in time for the appointment at something like 6.30 to meet the Lorenzans when they came. I drove her down to the hotel, she was going to have dinner with them also, and they, they went up at about 10 minutes and came back down. It was time for the Lorenzans to arrive, and finally Jim showed up alone without Coral, we went in and sat down for dinner, and before we ordered, but before the food was served, the hotel bellman brought a telephone and said, a call for you, Mr. Lorenzen. He took the call. He said, oh, the dog is sick. I've got to go back and, and, and help my wife. Well, we knew this sick dog story. It had happened many times before. It meant that she was, she was an alcoholic, you know, and she was in her cups, and she was, she had threatened him to get home immediately or else. So he left, and, and that's all the contact they ever had with the Lorenzans. The next day, Coral was ill until noon, like she usually was, and uh, and Jim was working, and there was no contact until they left the, by bus going on to Los Angeles to do some research on the Adevsky case, and the Lorenzans never did put in a, uh, an appearance. Well, if Jim did, but they, they never did honor the honorary invitation to be a part of this. But I took them in anyway as friends and, and, and kept them advised of what was developing. Okay.